Okay. Good evening. Good evening again. And uh, today we'll uh, talk about uh, uh, design processes. So um, the set of steps or phases that we must go through for actually building uh, our prototype uh, at the end of the course. Uh, remember that uh, one of the focus here is not just to build something that may work, but uh, to build it by following, say, sound procedures and sound methods. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, try to spend some time about uh, uh, reasoning about the design process uh, of, uh, in general, an ICT system, or more specifically, of course, our focus will be on ambient intelligence system. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what do we mean by design process? Well, I, I would take the second definition. The design process in the field of engineering, so not just computer engineering, is the formulation of a plan to help a team of engineers to build a system with specified performance and functionality goals. So at the end, we have a goal, a system that should perform according to some functionality that we define and with a sufficient level of performance. That is what we must reach, we should reach. It's the end goal. So do we just play with luck or with skills or with uh, work? Or we need, uh, probably if the goal is ambitious, is big, we need a sort of a plan. Okay, first we do this, then that, and then that, and so on. Uh, so a sort of steps uh, that uh, will help us to build the system. We give us some methods of work. Uh, the risk uh, is uh, to lose track of the goal and start working on some technical problem here or some issue there and then spending more time that we have. And uh, uh, at the end, uh, maybe we solved very well a given problem, but we missed uh, the general goal. So that's what we, why we need uh, some planning, okay? And some process to help us doing the planning. Okay, there are some, uh, some comics uh, for you uh, let's say to, to ponder about uh, uh, the idea of the processes but mainly every process starts with the description of what we want to achieve at the end. This is what we call requirements. Okay, first, first of all, we need to know what we are required to build. What are the requirements for the system? And uh, um, getting these requirements is not an easy task because we must understand what is needed by the users of the system for the system to do and therefore for us to implement and to, de and to design. And uh, communication between the engineers that will build the system and the users of the system is not always easy because they always speak different languages. So that's one one key part of the project, of the, of the problem, of the issues. Getting the requirements right. Being sure that I understood what the user or the customer wants and the user understood what I am going to create. If we say, succeed in this initial step, then the rest is only the matter of effort and money and time. It's not uh, automatically done, but uh, the, the hard part is understanding each other. So uh, what we'll describe uh, in, the, in a set of three classes, we will split this uh, topic in three classes in order to stop and do some examples also. Uh, we'll describe a, a, a process which is quite detailed. We, decide, we decided to, let's say, propose seven steps. Um, but uh, at the same time, we will show a simplified version of the process. We will be only four steps instead of seven that correspond more or less to the phases of the project in this course. 
So I'll try to make a general, let's say, presentation or discussion about the design processes so that you can reuse it in other contexts, but then we will trim it down, okay, saying, okay, but in this course we are not going to do this, okay? But we understand that in general it needs to be done, or it can be done. Okay, so before starting, uh, our process actually is already started because we launched the call for ideas and call for projects uh, just to put a, a bit of stress on you in addition to what you already have. I just remind you of the deadline next week. Um, I know we are, you already started to discuss, ask his question, and, and, it, and that's good. Uh, maybe the one suggestion I, I can give you if as, as soon as you have a group or an idea or whatever, start writing that into the document in the Google Drive. We, we are reading that hmm? in, most in real time. We are not judging anybody, but we we'll see how things are progressing. Maybe you have an idea, you have a group for in which one person is missing, then the other can go and see, okay, oh, I like the idea, can I join your group, and so on. So it's a, it's a good way also, since many of you don't know each other, to share the ideas there, even, uh, as we said, if you have more than one idea, you can list them. And then it's also a way of discussing and getting in touch and improving. Maybe we see that there are two groups with similar ideas, they can talk to each other, we can develop something together, or whatever. So since the time is quite tight, in, uh, next week uh, we want to add the full list ready, uh, one, my suggestion is just not, don't wait until the, the evening before to upload the document because it may help uh, if you start uploading even something pre preliminary, no? incomplete, but just to let other people know what we are doing. Hmm? Okay, but you know uh, everything else about the deadline. So let's start about the design process we, uh, we want to present. Again, to start light, uh, this is a quite uh, famous uh, uh, vignette or comic uh, that, that you find uh, in the software engineering box uh, that uh, describe, uh, I, I'll read you uh, a, a system, how the customer explained it. So the customer came and said, okay, I want this, and I described it in this way. How the project leader understood it. So when I say something and when another person understands what I say, there's always some mismatch. How the analyst designed it, how the programmer, the lazy programmer, wrote it, how the business consultant described it, you know, very shiny, very soft, this is really nice, how the project was documented, void, totally, uh, what operations installed, just a rope, how the customer was built, uh, how it was supported, and uh, nothing, and what the customer really needed. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, just of course uh, uh, for having some fun, but uh, uh, the idea is that there is a whole process that involves a lot of different professional roles, the customer, the engineer, support, maintenance, documentation, installation, marketing, and so on, uh, that need to agree on a design and need to ensure that everybody agrees on the same design, not everybody agrees on what they, there is, what's their own individual vision of the design, which is different. Hmm? Uh, so if you open a book or do a search about uh, software engineering processes, you'll find the uh, thousands of variations, every company, every researcher propose different types of, uh, uh, of processes, but uh, we try to select one, uh, one of the easiest ones uh, uh, to follow, which is more or less suitable for our type of systems. Mm -hmm. uh, one possible flow of activities about the, the many possible ones, uh, based on the, on the starting point that we have. So we, in, in this course, we, our starting point uh, are the features that we want to give to our systems. So we will develop a sort of a feature-driven process for ensuring that these three features get into the system. It will not be a technology-driven process. It will not be a totally user-driven process. It will not be a testing-driven process, or so, or not in the category of the agile system, because we don't have time for many iterations, and so on. So it will be quite simple. Hmm? 
but uh, in, the, in different processes you will see that this, the steps that we describe maybe uh, they are arranged in a different way but more or less they are the same so they can be reused so the process is uh, something that is in between the initial idea and the working system we need something to connect to the beginning and the end of this uh, whole process uh, the assumption that we make in this, pro in this process and the constraints that also we will enforce is that uh, we want to work as much as possible in a technology neutral way hmm? so we don't want to decide which technologies we are going to use at the beginning of the project or before analyzing other issues we want uh, technologies to be selected according to what the project needs in an open-minded and wide let's say sense um, the first point the second point is uh, try to reuse uh, as much as possible what is already there so if there is something available there may be a solution a software may be a device a sensor and it's available and suitable for our goal so suitable means that the technical characteristics fit what we want and available means that it's in the lab or we can get uh, hold of it uh, quite easily it doesn't cost too much or somebody can lend us uh, an item of it well if it's available and feasible let's use it and let's try to integrate what is already there and only where no existing solution is it can be found then we can resort to creating our own okay so we are not saying we don't want to do any say, electronics we can do but only after we have checked that nothing available and suitable uh, with the right characteristics uh, uh, can fit into this uh, into the it is already available and can fit into our project mm -hmm. so there are these, these two main we consider a po the possibility of having to build something you know, last week you saw, you saw some hardware wiring uh, that can be done with the, with the Raspberry, uh, but only if uh, uh, some other component cannot do the job. Okay, within these assumptions and uh, with our goals, uh, more or less this will be the process. I said seven steps, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, starting from an idea to some users that will be happy to use the system. And uh, uh, just uh, to understand the picture, uh, this uh, square represents an activity that we, we carry on. And when we have the double bars, it represents a, a complex activity that needs to be decomposed into further steps hmm, to be better understood. Otherwise, this would be atomic or single activities. Uh, activities uh, generate, produce, or receive as inputs some sort of documents documents may be reports may be specifications may be software may be uh, mockups of the user interfaces or whatever we we take it in a general sense hmm? so you see that in general or at different at the output at uh, of different steps there are some documents that are produced and these documents usually feed the input of the next steps hmm? this is how is how things goes You cannot start this step until you are sure or you have information or, document or traceable documentation, we call it also like that, that the previous step are finished and what we decided in the previous step. The, the big risk is that we go up to the end and then we forget something that was well, not really quite decided at the beginning, but at the end it turns out to be different than what we, managed, than what we imagined, and so we need to go back and redo part of the work hmm? we won't have much time to do that rework in our pro in our course hmm? so let's try to get it right more or less at the first time so in general all this process is made as a, uh, as a sequence of steps that all look like this template something to do something to do next and some output uh, from the previous activity that will become an input to the next one and in many cases, we will also have some iterations 
because uh, actually something looks like looks good or looks excellent on paper but when you start implementing it or if you start selecting components or when you start going to details you find that okay your idea was very nicely described but doesn't work hmm? and so you need to go back and modify something and so what you see is that uh, in the left part there's practically no iteration because we still don't have anything tangible hmm? it's all paperwork but in the right column when we start doing some code work uh, iterations are there always hmm? we we will iterate here uh, across these different phases so i separated them as, diff as different steps but actually they are going more or less in parallel or you can recycle and really let, let's play for that hmm? so uh <laughs> the two columns, I, I would just to be very synthetic, I would call them the specification phase and the development that would be an iterative development because we, are of, of course, we need to, to change something uh, as, time by, uh, as time goes and as we understand better what we are building. Hmm? The specification phase, in a way, ends when everything is clear about what the system needs to do in many settings not here but in many settings actually these two steps are performed by different companies so there will be one company that does an, the analysis and the specification of a system and that gives a contract to a separate company to a subcontractor to implement it and you understand that when the, there are two different entities it's very important uh, to have a very say, clear idea of what is the documentation that binds this contract. Because these contractors or these other uh, people will build what I require them in a contract in a, with a technical description. So this is what binds uh, the idea of the system with the behavior of the system we build is actually the information, the documentation that flows across this long arrow. So that's why we are stressing a lot the importance of thinking and writing down what the system should do, the specification. Seven steps, but in our case, uh, we will only have four. Let's, let's say four plus one, because step zero it's already ongoing is define the title of the project huh? so what we are doing by the 20th of march then we will ask you uh, we will come to this one by one of course in detail uh, by the next but the week after that so by the 26th to expand a bit more what you already proposed in the, in the title the idea is that on the 20th 20, on the 19 and 20th we will you will also you may get some feedback from us. Say, oh, okay, it's okay, but try to improve this aspect or, or not. So you will have one week to, once you already know what is the project that uh, the idea has been approved, and what are a couple of suggestions, you have one week to describe it into a more, say, a complete description that will cover some analysis and uh, maybe not uh, a bit of a requirement dissertation but uh, uh, it's dashed and they will sh tell you why hmm? and the next step will be analysis and this will be the deadline uh, coming up with the uh, requirement documents system design that will develop the architecture and then the implementation whose deadline is just the exam so you can go up to the so we finish actually the part of the documentation and the specification of the system by the end of april so 4th of May will be the, the, lay, the last paperwork we ask from you. Hmm? Um, but let's analyze uh, one by one the, all the seven steps. Today will be for the first three, probably. Hmm? So the first step is uh, stating the problem. Starting from the idea, so what you are developing right now, once you have fixed the idea, you need to describe it hmm? i call that a summary system description defining what problems need to be solved by the system 
if a system doesn't solve any problem, it's useless. Maybe a little problem only for one minority of users, but there may be something to solve. Okay? Uh, so let's start from that. Why the world will be better when our project is completed? That's a real question to be able to, to, be able to ask. And you should be able to reply in uh, five words or 10 words, no more. Not a long uh, discussion and uh, statement that, that tends to, to say nothing or, or to be very general. No, very precise. I, and this means uh, identifying the benefits, maybe for, mainly for the users. Okay, the users are going, are loving to use the system because it saves them time, it makes them pro more productive, more fun, it, they, they may be in touch with their friends, uh, they will find a place in the uh, room, they will, they will not get lost, uh, they will not starve, or whatever. Hmm? Or maybe there will also, some, depending on the project, some benefits for the environment. Okay, I don't, mean, I don't mean the global heating problem about the environment, but uh, uh, our campus. Hmm? Uh, resources will be better utilized, uh, or energy will be saved, uh, or there will be just some, some tangible result. Hmm? But as we know, we don't want uh, projects that only concentrate on the environment. The users should, should always be there. Hmm? And at the end, uh, we just create a brief summary of what the system does for the user. Actually, as I said, it's already something that we are, we are requesting you for next week. For the week later, we will only ask you to write it better and more, with, with a bit more detail. The idea is just having one page of a vision. How I see in my vision the system operating and working with my users. And again, in this phase, we want to be technology neutral, so let's not mention about technologies, okay? Until the 26th of March, I don't want to hear anything about technology. No Bluetooth, no Raspberry, no Wi-Fi, no, no technology item. It would be hard, I know, to describe what you want to do without grounded, we, we know that some technology is needed. But uh, think about the problems to be solved. Uh, are you able to describe the problem without using technology words? Yes. You, we should be. Otherwise, uh, we are describing a technology problem, not a user problem. Right? It's not easy. But this is the effort that we need to do in this initial phase. And to have a strong case for a system that really solves something, independent in how, of, on how it's implemented. We will have to make thousands of compromises during implementation, during design, choosing a technology instead of another one. Okay, it will become later. But uh, these compromises or, desi or these design decisions will not affect our goal, satisfying some user need hmm? or solving some user problem. Define a target environment, so where is the system supposed to work? The classroom, in the, in the hallway, in the lab, uh, in the canteen. Define, choose one of these. Uh, let's don't, don't try to say, oh, it, it may work in a classroom, but also in an office, if not in the canteen. Mm? Uh, it's not a choice. It's, it's a list of possibilities. It's not a proposal. It's something that still needs to be worked out, because for sure, the user needs in a classroom are different from the user needs in an office. So. If you are not sure about how, where it, it, it needs to be, let's say, useful, then you still don't know what it's useful for. Hmm? At the same time, define the users. 
it may, it may be maybe uh, the students and teacher, okay, but more than one type of user. It's easier if you target one type of user, though, instead of more than one, because then it will be difficult to have different users that have the same needs. We are not asking to create or to define huge projects, very large projects. It's okay if you focus on small things as long as, the, as they make sense. Hmm? Describing how the environment supports the users from the user point of view, it's again the same, from the user point of view. And trying to hint at the MEI features. So ask yourself, whether, whether I'm reading your description, do I see whether a system is sensitive? Do I see whether a system is intelligent? Do I see whether a system is adaptive? And so on. But if I say, if I reply no to all of this, it will be a problem. If, if I reply no to one of two of these, it may be okay. Yeah, we, may, we may not cover everything, of course. And the idea is this, to imagine selling it to a non-engineer. So if you still have any friends left since you started the Polytechnico, uh, try to find some who don't do engineers, engineering, don't do technical faculties. And write your vision, it's one page, okay? If they are friends, they will read the page for you. And let them read what you wrote and say, okay, what do you think? What do you, what do you understand? How would you describe it? You will discover a lot of things about the way we think different from the other. Okay, let's do this exercise. It's only one page. You write it and then find somebody to read it. But don't explain it beforehand, what it's about. Hmm? Uh, and so, uh, suggestions to, for writing a, an effective vision that actually concentrate on the user needs. Uh, tips for writing that, uh, again, I, I'm repeating myself, not technology, but of course we must know at least that the, project, that the problem we are proposing is feasible. Hmm? It's not a perpetual motion or uh, anything that will require uh, uh, teraflops of, of computation uh, or, or whatever. Hmm? Something that more or less, we know that there are solutions. Maybe we have the idea that the solution may be three or four different technologies, and later we will study the best one. But let's, let's hide technology, but be sure that we are able to solve these problems hmm? later. Starting simple, few features, few users, okay? Few categories of users, of course. But full, full MEI features, so a, a small, some nine, uh, niche application for a very specific need, which is solved well. It's better than something that solves no problem really at all for all of people, for a lot of people. Hmm? Uh, pitch, pitch is uh, one jargon that is very used in the startups. Uh, when you are proposing a project to a, 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 um, a funding agency, they will ask you to pitch your idea, to do a very short pitch, a very short talk, three minutes or something like that, to sell your ideas and to show how good it is, okay. We are not doing this. Hmm? We are not uh, trying to sell or to uh, show that something is economically viable or something like that. But uh, try to say in two minutes, to explain to me, to somebody, again, who's not a technical person, why user should be happy to use it. Try it, uh, train it. Telling a story is a good way of going. Telling a story about the user, what the user does. Google it is very important. Uh, we have the cleverest idea in the world, okay, but before we write a single word about that, Let's try to find our idea on Google. Maybe it's not there. Maybe ours is really new, but we need to know, we want to know what others did. So we list uh, the keywords that, that are important for us and try to find 
search something with these keywords or combinations or variations of these keywords, and you will see other projects, other ideas, other products, a lot of bullshit. Uh, I don't know if I can say this word, but uh, because the articles that tell uh, nothing in 20 pages and uh, something like that, or products that will, never, that will never see the light, or that saw the light and then never saw the unit, and there was, there's a lot to learn about the similar projects that started out, understanding which succeeded, which failed, and why. Hmm? Uh, and involving users. Disca describe, discuss, ask to the users, <laughs> but then the most important part is uh, listening to what the users have to tell you back. Okay, I, wit I witnessed uh, too many engineers talking to end users, explaining something, and the user thought, but uh, I don't think it's like that, or something, or they gave some feedback, and then the engineer insisted, no, you're wrong. Uh, my idea is right. Okay, so don't come to me to talk to me, don't waste my time. So listening. Because the, the mantra should be the users know better. Right? Know better what are their needs. Except when they don't. Uh, meaning that in some cases we are, it's very rare, but may happen, we are solving some needs uh, that the users don't realize yet they have. It's something that they lived up to yesterday without, and without realizing that there's a problem in the way they are doing some things and it can be done better. So, in a way, it's easy to ask users about feedback from something which is familiar to them. It's very difficult to ask uh, feedback about something they need to imagine because they never saw anything similar to that. So in that case, the judgment of, let's say, technical person or more structured, structured way of interviewing users are needed uh, because just a direct feedback would say, but what's that? I don't need it. Hmm? Okay, all this process will be in uh, deliverable one. Will be asked and, and uh, by the 26th of March. So all this one page work, the vision, will, will, uh, will need to be ready by the 26th. So on the 20th, you clo we close the groups Immediately, we will create some uh, repositories and uh, with your usernames on GitHub. And from the repositories, we will enable uh, the, for you the creation of the pages, web pages, websites for the project, everything on GitHub. We will give you instructions, of course, later on. So in, you have one week to, the, to say, set up one of the websites. It's just that. A two minutes work if you use one of the templates that, that are already provided. So don't, uh, don't, uh, you don't need yet to develop a website with HTML or uh, advanced skills or anything dynamic. Just uh, uh, populating it with some information about the project and mainly the vision document. Hmm? So on the 26th, we'll check uh, all the websites uh, to see whether they, they have or they have been created and they have this vision document. We will an analyze this uh, uh, document that you provide, and they will give you feedback uh, in this section on the 30th. So one week later, give us some, some time to look at them. And the third will be, a, it's a Monday, uh, will be a session in La Dispe, when you can work on your project and refine the idea and so on, and we will go group by group uh, by giving comments about what they, uh, what they wrote on their, on their website. Okay, it's all tightly scheduled, you know. And at this point, uh, the project will not be changed anymore. So we fix the project, that will be the goals, uh, that will be something that we want to implement, and we will need to implement. The only thing that we will have to do would be to simplify it, probably, because the vision will be very general, very comprehensive, uh, very complete, uh, but then when we implement something, we say, okay, but there are some priorities. There's something that should be more important than some other things, uh, and so we'll cut it out. So I, I try to do the, the vision description about my rooster project uh, uh, that I presented you last, uh, last time. And uh, 
I have a paragraph here that uh, more or less tells uh, the same thing that I presented to you last time as the proposal of the project, but then I tried uh, to write at the beginning a story from the point of view of the user, describing the system from the point of view of the user. Why they benefit. A user requires their own personalized wake up experience. They will be happy because they will never miss a wake up call. They will never be late. And well, every morning will be a pleasing experience. Hmm? Okay, we try to sell it, of course, in some way. Hmm? And uh, the, uh, your house, your device, your calendars will team up to personalize the optimum wake up call, personalized to you and personalized to your day schedule, location, and mood. I don't know how to get mood, uh, how to insert mood into this, but uh, it, it looks nice in this center. Okay, so we can hmm, exaggerate a bit, but not too much for the sake of uh, involving the user enthusiasm. Hmm? In this description, it say, okay, we don't talk about technology, but we need to know that this Technologies can be solved. Right now, I have no idea how to get mood into the um, into this system. So maybe we'll delete it later. I don't know. And also, the pleasing experience is something I cannot promise really. Hmm? I, I just hope. But it's something like that. Just elaborate on the description to tell a story related to the user. And we want to have a lot of satisfied users like this uh, guy here. <laughs> and, and okay, he really likes the system. Step one. The second step is okay. We have this vision. Maybe we discuss it with a couple of users. A good. Uh, uh, at this point, we need to expand the description. Actually, draw the boundary of the project, what is in and what is out, what is needed and what is optional, or what is out of scope in our system. So what are the real requirements for the system that will make the users happy and the stakeholders happy? What does it mean? It means uh, considering the needs and the opinions of other people Need is something that they really have to have, or maybe the opinion, the preference, and something they ask they would like to. And we have two different uh, types of persons that we may want to listen to. Users of the system, so the people that who are going to use the system on a day-to-day -day basis. And also the stakeholders of the system. Stakeholder is a management term that in general refers to one person who has an interest in the success of an initiative. So something that maybe they don't use the system, but if the system performs well, they will have an advantage, they will have a benefit. Maybe the managers, the investors, the, uh, I don't know, maybe it's a system for students I don't know, to find a classroom, okay, the teachers are also, are also stakeholders of the system because they will have students, uh, they will know which students are coming to class, uh, they will, uh, students will not be late or something like that. Or if the, cla of the class before ends late, uh, thanks to the colleague, on the other side, uh, they will maybe, uh, no, be notified or something. So maybe the teacher will not use the system, but will benefit if the system works well. So in that, in that way, it's a stakeholder. It has a stake saying, okay, if uh, it's my interest, I would put some, I, I would be willing to put some investment of mine because if the system works, I will have a benefit in return, even if, it's, if I'm not a user. Hmm? So it's a general, a more general concept than, than direct users. These opinions should be collected and evaluated carefully and objectively. So we should listen to the users. We should not be enslaved by the users. So net, not, okay, users are always right, but if there is one user which is really a strange person 
and uh, comes out with really weird requirements that we are not obliged to listen to them. Uh, in the end, uh, it's our project. So it's us who decide what is in and what is out of the requirement. We, de we decide, listen to the users. It's not the users who just dictate uh, the requirements to us. We are not forced or obliged to take into account every possible requirement because otherwise we will never be finished. We need to cut it down. People have a lot of things in mind. We will need to carve one product out of a lot of ideas. Then there will be space maybe for another product or another project that satisfies some other piece, some other portion of the user requirement. So we must keep our initial focus. That is why we want to do all of this more extensive work of understanding the users only after we have defined the vision and validated it. Because otherwise we will be never finished, we will be never over, because if we were writing the vision and then we listen to one person, they, they will change our view. And then again, and then again, and it's never finished. So we set up a focus and then we try to expand the details about this focus. But the, the focus should, should not change. Unless, of course, we discover that we were totally wrong at the beginning. We, so we didn't do our homework right in the first step. So if needed, we can adapt your vision, but it's us who get convinced that it's really needed to change. It's not that some user say, I don't like this word, change it. No, we don't. Uh, um, this is a process that would need to involve users, doing interviews, doing, doing, doing surveys, making prototypes, maybe also paper prototypes, doing focus groups. There's a lot of techniques. I will uh, mention briefly some of this. It would take a lot of time that we don't have in this course. Okay, so it's a pity, but uh, we cannot do a formal user. Uh, say, feedback during the course here. Let's try to do it informally. Let's try to get some information from users, talk to people, let's say. But it's not a formal process saying talk to people. We, we don't require and we won't have time to use the tools that I'm going to mention in a second. Okay? Um, it, it's, uh, it's another maybe six credit course understanding to do uh, user center design as it's called. But uh, I want to mention this, even if we are not doing this course here, uh, because it's essential for any other successful product. So it's a step that is often missed, especially by startups that are many uh, really uh, technology driven. They have a very great technological object in mind. Well, a great technological object doesn't translate into a good product because a good product would be good in the eyes of the users, not in the eyes of the developers. So let's not forget this step when you are in the real world. What do the user thinks about, think about our idea? Okay, but, so we are not doing that, but let me spend some, some words on it. Um, the difference between users and stakeholders is it's defined in a clearer way here. The users are the final persons persons hmm, that will uh, use the system, the, the final targets of the system that will interact really with the system. The user is not the developer. Huh? The developer is the worst possible user for a system. Okay, also in testing, in evaluation, always try to find a person which, who is as different as possible from the developer that contributed to create the system. If we don't have real users, let's try to find persons with similar characteristics to the actual users. Okay, here it's not, it should not be a problem because we are working on a campus project. Okay, so uh, it's easy to find students, uh, staff, uh, professors, technicians, and so on uh, available for, for a talk or something like that. Hmm? But in another case, it may be it's difficult because it's something that, uh, you know, it's only for the Himalayas pe people uh, who are living in the high mountains, and we, are not, we don't have many of them here. And, uh, and so let's try to, to, to 
approximate the target user. Hmm? Uh, the user don't need to understand how the system works. If it's better if they don't. They don't need to explain, oh, okay, this is connected through the network, just explaining what it does, hmm? what it does for them. Because the user just need to understand how they will interact with the system. What do I need to do? What will I get back? On the other hand, the stakeholders are the persons, or maybe in some cases institutions, they don't really need to be real persons, that will have an interest in the success of the uh, systems. Maybe users, or some other categories which are not directly users, and this interest may be an economic interest, directly, they do some cost savings. I don't know if you are doing an energy saving project, Polytechnic will be happy, hmm? because it may save some energy and so in some money. Uh, efficiency, user satisfaction, our control, and other interests that are not necessarily uh, in money form. Hmm? The idea is that people that could be involved in funding the system, they would put one euro for development. Hmm? Uh, users know better, I said before, uh, but uh, we need to extract this knowledge from users. Um, you, we, we saw in the first class that uh, every definition, every paper about ambient intelligence always talks about the users which are, that are the cornerstone, the central point of every system, and then they forget about them. Uh, <coughs> across the years, there, there are different uh, design methodologies that were proposed uh, that try to explicitly take into account the users through the whole design process. Um, it's something relatively new. Maybe for you it's not so new because it's, you're so familiar with new technologies, or I say you are not so familiar with older technologies. Uh, imagine you know, the usability of mobile applications. You just install them and you use them within 10 seconds without any training, any instructions, any manual or whatever. Is why are they so easy to use? Uh, because from the beginning they were they were designed with the users in mind. Well, not just with the users in mind, with the users on board. In the group that designed the, the application, the website, or whatever. Since the beginning, we involved or they involved users to have discussions, to compare. Of course, not to discuss about development but about functions, about interfaces, about uh, the icons, about text, about colors, about uh, a lot of uh, issues that users uh, would, uh, would appreciate. So these user-centered design methodologies are a set of methodologies that says how to involve the users throughout the different phases of development of a process, starting from the very beginning. This is quite normal today, but it's not was not normal in classical software engineering who are the developed well there was an analyst they still call it in this way so an engineer that, that does the analysis of the system write the requirements and then the system is built and only and at the end we do the user training to teach the users how to use the system so in many cases users were able to see the system only when it was finished and they hated it and we hate it today, every day, many systems. Just compare, I don't know, Facebook with the Portale della Didattica in terms of ease of usage. Uh, just uh, it's a consequence of the process of development. I developed uh, thinking about the user or I developed jointly with the user. And uh, uh, this was, say, a, a strong movement and uh, the development of the, of the web, in which one application has a potential of uh, millions of users and there is no chance of training them. And if the website or the web application or the service is not easy to use, is not captivating at the beginning, in the first five seconds, you just go away. I don't like it. Okay. Close the window. Uh, go back to do something else. So we have a very, very small window of opportunity 
if you are developing mobile application or website for uh, say pleasing the users in the in a few seconds when they see your your uh, site or your application your mobile and so on so the usability um, engaging the user may if you are solving their problems is very important to be and not having any difficulty in using the system what does this icon mean and uh, uh, hiding advanced functionality and so on so it's something that with the explosion of the web and then later mobile application usability became more and more and more important and in fact today the systems that are less usable are the closed system the intranets of companies where there is no so big urge of uh, satisfying users, but we have people who are forced, who are obliged to use the system. And so even if it's, if it's ugly, if it's difficult, they have to use it, like our, our internal system, for example, at the university. I mean, the, these uh, ideas were formalized uh, strongly enough uh, to be the subject of an ISO norm, uh, uh, recommendation is called this st uh, standard for human centered design for interactive system which is of course very general but uh, uh, lists a lot of uh, specific requirements from the process point of view explicit understanding of users tasks and environment that will be said we n must understand what the users want and what tasks what the functions what activities users will do users are involved throughout design and development hmm? It takes time, of course, to organize meeting with users. But uh, let's say launching a wrong product is, is even worse. We, not, we must realize that. Design is driven and refined by user-centered evaluation. So since the first prototypes show the users what you've done, and say, try to get maybe correct what you are doing by analyzing their evaluation. And um, OK. Uh, there are different tools, methods for involving users, okay? You just don't go out and ask. Uh, there are some conceptual tools, for example, describing, defining what they call personas. A persona is an imaginary person who has some given characteristics. Our prototype user. So I call it, I, I, I call it a name, maybe I call it John. John is a student of 22 years enrolled in civil engineering and so on and so on. He has two sisters. I, I, I make up one person who has some characteristics. So I try to say cluster all the possible users that he have into some types, some groups. You know, the, the nerd, the sportsman, the, uh, and the, I don't know, the, the one who is late with the studies and the international students, uh, some one representative person or persona, because it's not a real person, uh, for, for every macro category of users that will help us tell, okay, this functionality is for John, not this is for Jack. It better suits their needs. Huh? It would be easy to just to reason to do say mind experiments about the user that will how the user will use the system and also describing telling stories and uh, these personas will, will play write a story about this person with fictional stories about these daily lives of uh, or of these personas this comes to the university does this and goes there uh, it's a way it doesn't change anything. It's only a way for helping us to think about how the system, thinking in abstract terms is difficult. So we make examples. Example of people describe this characteristic. We give them an individuality and then describe what they're doing during their life, during the day, and how they use the system. Actually, during the day, in some moments they will interact with the system and the interaction of the user with the system is called the use case one moment in which the user is using the system maybe 
Two minutes later, the same user is doing something else. But in that period, he's doing something with the system. Because he wants to. Because they need to do something with the system. They want to do something with the system. So what is the use case? Check my email. It's a use case. I want to do something. I describe how I'm doing it. And so breaking down the system functionalities into a set of many small use cases, small or longer, but independent use cases that the different personas will use throughout their day. It's a good way of extracting the essential functionality of the system. And uh, how to interact with the user, how to get information is the most difficult part. We sit, we think, we discuss, and then we need to ask uh, five users, 10, 50, 100. How do we organize it? How do we organize it? And these are all, all tools, let's say, techniques that we may use uh, to involve users and to get information from them in a structured way. We don't go into the details about that, of course. Uh, interviews is something that you can do with a limited number of persons, and then it's up to you to understand what they told you in the interview. And uh, uh, focus group is more structured. You invite uh, some people into a room and try to stimulate a discussion on a topic and see how these people react to some ideas and how they pose ideas from the, on themselves. Of course, you need, you need uh, to prepare a script, some questions, some objectives. Uh, there are techniques. Uh, that border from, uh, say, the usability, the computer science, and the psychology domains. Hmm? And uh, you may, may, at the end, you may also do some usability testing. So having a prototype of the system, even if it's not finished, and give it into the hands of the people and see how they use it. They can find the button to start it. Oh, it's an issue. You don't need to, uh, you should not explain to them how to use it, and so on. Uh, these are all techniques that, if you want to study some user centered designs, they are all, they are all listed. Uh, and so the idea is that at the end, uh, we will better understand what the user would like about the system, and therefore, what are the main priorities of, of our system. I, can, I don't have the time or the budget to build the whole complete system in one step. We will do one, version one, and then if successful, we will go to version two and three. What is in version one and not in version two? In version one, we should have, we should have the key features, what makes the product distinctive and unique enough to be successful. And version two and three will be the wannabe, no? the, something that would be nice to have and so on. And the users will help us put a value tag on the different features and say, okay, this feature will be, would be valued higher by the users than this other one. So let's put it into uh, version one and let's skip that into the version 75. Hmm? <coughs> and so under constraints about the price, the, how it looks, and the, so the idea is elaborating our ideas into be, making it become the user's idea of our product. Hmm? This is the, the, the result of all this process. If you, are, if you like these kind of topics, uh, these are two, uh, two main books. They are, not, uh, uh, they are not practical instructions, but they give you the background to think about this. No? They, and they are also fun, fun to read, both of them. Um, beware of this, but so usability is not the M plus one feature. Okay, it's not something you should add. These uh, comic tests have two things. First, usability or easy to use uh, is not one additional feature, but it's the characteristic, the basic characteristic that all other features should have. And the second thing the test has is uh, 
the fewer features, the better. So let's, let's aim at the minimum. Then we can always, always add later. But let's not start with, with something which is really too complex, right? Not build a system and then make it usable. Hmm? You, it's, you are lost in the beginning. Okay, there is no deliverable about this because, as I said, this step will not be formalized in this course. Hmm? I just wanted to give you a hint of what the benefits are of talking to the users. And if you want to understand the tools, uh, there are some pointers. <clears throat> okay, step three, back to hard work. We had fun with users. We had uh, our project refined, our vision uh, better shaped. And then we need to start listing down one by one all the features of the system. One, two, three, four, five. 327, 328, and so on. The list of the, uh, the requirements. Uh, the initial vision, which is still one page or a couple of pages, needs to be translated into a list of requirements. What is in, what is out. What the system needs to do. Full, comprehensive, and detailed list. And not talking about the functions function points in the code or the classes or the web pages, but functionality, actions that the system does, or different, we can use that, that terminology, use cases that the system offers to the users. What the system does. And uh, you can imagine that as a specification contract. So you write this list of requirements uh, and try to imagine that you are giving this list to somebody else to build the system, to implement the system. So you should not teach them where to put semicolons, which in Python are not uh, needed. Uh, but uh, what uh, the system that they will ship to you back uh, needs will do. Something that will enable you to say, okay, the system you gave me is exactly what they want, or isn't what they want, because it doesn't satisfy this requirement. You didn't take into account this. A list of do and don'ts, or mainly do's. And so we need to learn how to write and extract and organize these requirements. By itself, by themselves, sorry, requirements are a project on themselves. Uh, it's, it's a document which is not easy to write and not something, it needs a process to write, but we, don't, we are not going into meta design over here. The idea is, uh, what do we mean by expressing a requirement about a system? It means, uh, or it may mean different things at different stages. It may be something very, or quite high level, statement of uh, the system needs to do this, or will be able to do this, or will enable the users to do this. Hmm? Or maybe, uh, maybe general, or may, well, the system will enable users to wake up in the morning. It's a requirement. It's very high level because actually it doesn't, uh, anything, uh, even hammer, would satisfy the requirement of waking up the person in the morning. Huh? It's not the, project we had in mind, but it's included into that requirement. So maybe it's too general, let's better be more specific. Um, the idea is that this requirement should be precise enough to be able to, uh, say, check the validity of the contract. Does the, pro does the product you gave me satisfy the requirement, yes or no? Uh, but no more precise than that, no more detailed than that, because we don't want to constrain uselessly the implementation of the system. Hmm? Uh, what we say usually is that uh, requirements can be classified as user requirements or system requirements, system or development requirements. These requirements uh, mainly concern 
what the system does, what functions the system provides to the users, what characteristics the users may see in the system. And they should be written in a way that users or customers can understand. Okay. If you say to check your mail, uh, select the, raw, the, 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 the red icon, okay. If I say in the requirement, uh, I don't know, the selection event on the icon uh, 27 uh, triggers uh, the mail notification check, it's the same thing, but users will not understand it. Developers will, and will know how, where to hook the event uh, handler for this specific event and what to do when that happens. So the same thing can be worded, expressed in a way that users will understand it, for the users to understand it, or worded in a way for developers to act as a specification for developers. Hmm? It would be better that every requirement is written in the two ways. So that in the same place uh, you have, uh, because just to avoid the swing uh, effect, that users understand one thing and developers develop something else. Uh, he, he, they, are, they have two different languages, but uh, we need to check their match. So this is an example, but we'll, we won't go into that, uh, of another system where we have one sentence saying to the user what the system does, and this, the same requirement is the <coughs> broken down in a, to more detailed items for the developers because they, they will correspond to different functions to be implemented. Uh, the idea, just a word on this slide, uh, that uh, user requirements may be read also by clients and users while the system requirements uh, will not be uh, necessarily used by the, the, the end users, hmm? but only by the, the, the development staff. But we don't, we don't spend too much time with this distinction. Okay, let's go down about uh, what we write in these requirements. There are two very large sets of information, groups of information, that we split in uh, as uh, functional requirements and non-functional requirements for the lack of a better name. Functional requirements are the core, maybe, of the system. They state what the system should do, what services, what actions, what functions, what interactions, what uh, screens, what uh, the system will provide to the user. Imagine to list down every single thing you can do with the system. The users can do with the system. Every possible use case that the, system, that the user may activate, may go through while using the system. Something the system does. Non-functional requirements, and we'll go into detail in a second. Non-functional requirements, on the other hand, are the way, the context, the attributes, the qualities that the system has and w must maintain while delivering the functional requirements. Functional requirement may be you can check your email. A non-functional requirement would be you can check it in less than one second. Or you can check it with less than two clicks. So it's a constraint, it's a quality, it's an attribute on how constraints the way you can implement this functionality performance, usability, speed, security. These are all non-functional requirements. They don't specify what the system does, but put constraints, specify additional specifications about 
how the system will have to do the other functional requirements. Well, there may be also some domain requirements that come from outside. Okay, so if, uh, if, a system, if it's a system that needs to run, I don't know, underwater, well, there will be a lot of other constraints for the fact that it's underwater or for the fact that it's uh, in a public space or for the fact that it's, uh, I don't know, it's dealing with money, with money transactions, so it has a lot of other constraints that we don't decide. But they are decided by the domain, by the environment, by the legislation in some cases, uh, specific to what the system is doing. We don't, we just have to take that, those into account, but we don't decide. So, about functional requirements. What the system does, what, the, what function it offers to the users. Let's try not to care yet huh, about how they will be implemented. What I'm saying, the system may allow me to check my email, or it may be done in different ways, by selecting a, a voice for a menu, or an icon, or a toolbar, or swiping, or whatever. Okay, it's, a, it's an interface issue. What I want to check is that the functionality is there. Maybe if, uh, if I have the mobile front end, there would be one interface way of, inter of activating that function, and if, uh, if it's a web application, it would be done differently. But in both cases, the functionality must be there. So we don't want yet to go into the detail, an icon, a menu, or whatever, but what it does. And uh, I see functional requirements as a sort of local features. Local means in terms of, of software, of code. I can show you the 12 lines of code that implement that specific functionality. If I delete those lines, that functionality will not work anymore. If the functionality works because there's some piece of code, localized usually, that takes care of that, of that function. You can send an email. Okay, there's the code for composing, the code for sending. They are in two different places. But it's all there. Delete that code, the functionality is gone. That's what I mean by local. So in a way, it's easy to check whether a function, whether a functional, a functional requirement is implemented or not. You just try that function. Try to check your mail. Does it work? Yes, OK. Does it work in all cases? Well, let's try it. Yes. Because it's a local check. You will have a long list of local checks or local functions to implement. Okay? Examples about our rooster. Uh, I try to give uh, fantasy numbers uh, to these functional requirements, FR, trying to imagine uh, different sections of a document with list all of them. Now, let's, do, let's not number them one to 1,000 but uh, 3, 3.1, 3.2 different, um, by clustering them on the topic. Uh, for example, the user must be able to deactivate and deactivate the wake-up service. And this decision will be applied until the user changes it again. Okay, I want to turn it off and then enable it again without losing all the settings that I have. Does it make sense? That does the user, will a user be able to understand this? Is it easy to check whether it's actually implemented or not? Is it easy to find which are the lines of code that implement this? Yes to all of them. Right? The user must be able to silence. I, I added the second sentence after rereading the first one. Because then activate and deactivate in the wake up service and until when? So I want it to be more explicit. Uh, because if you are, imagine, if you are outsourcing this implementation to somebody else, uh, you want them to, not to second guess about what you had in mind, but actually to be explicit about how it should work. The user might be able to silence the wake up service just for the next day. Service will resume automatically on the following day. Another possibility. Tomorrow I'm sick or I'm uh, I, I want to relax or whatever, shut down. 
in another area of documents, section four, the user must be able to set up an ad hoc wake up call that will only run once, will not be remembered, and will have specific settings. Maybe it's important, maybe it's not, depends. Huh? But it's a possible feature. It's a functional requirement, written in the language of the users, easy to understand how to activate it and whether it works, what it does, what's the effect, and uh, to test it. And then uh, sub-cases, they uh, will have specific settings, and then two sub-functional requirements that the user may configure the settings of any already defined call, or the user may configure the default setting for all new ad hoc calls. And they can get more details. This kind of description, just imagining, imagine to describe all of them, well, you are, you are creating easily a thousand items. But then it would be easier also to create a system because you take them one by one, implement them. Non-functional requirements are a different beast. They define system properties which usually are global at the level of the system and constraints that apply to the system as a whole. Uh, a response time, for example. The system should be quick. What does it mean? Nothing. The system should reply within 300 milliseconds. Okay, it's a requirement. Quick is not a requirement. Just some fancy word. The system should reply within 300 milliseconds, full stop. When? For what? Always. For any action. For any of the 227 functional requirements, each of them must reply within 300 milliseconds. So having one non-functional requirement uh, creates a constraint on how, on the way we implement all the other functional requirements, every one. It's not local. There's not a, <laughs> one place, it would be nice, eh, to have one place in your code when you express that uh, the system is quick enough, it's less than 300 milliseconds, into, into three or four lines of code. And then it will apply to all the rest. No, it doesn't work like this. Huh? So there are a lot of other constraints that we want to describe, but usually they are not uh, as numerous, or as long as a long list uh, as functional ones. They are general requirements uh, that we need uh, to satisfy. They are more critical. They are impossible to change afterwards, or usually. Changing from 300 to 200 milliseconds, for example, would probably imply redesigning half of the system. But if these are not met, the system may be useless. Uh, so non-functional requirements, uh, I would call them more pervasive. They are general. They apply to every single line of code that you write. They are like the devil. Hmm? They are everywhere, in every corner. You cannot just track them down to a single spot in the system implementation. They need to apply to the system as a whole. Uh, but the system as a whole doesn't exist. The system is made of many single, many lines of code, so it has to apply to every single line of code. When, when we're writing that, are we breaking the performance requirements? Are we breaking the memory footprint requirements? Are we breaking the storage requirements? Are we breaking the network requirements? Are we breaking the user interface requirements? Uh, yes. Huh? It's, uh, that's the role of non-functional requirements to put constraints in the, in the way you design the rest of the system. Every line of code, every function, every module must guarantee that no functional, no non-functional requirement is broken. Hmm? Uh, this is a, an example taxonomy about uh, these non-functional requirements. Uh, the ones that are more interesting to us are those in the top right of the picture, so the requirement non-functional requirements uh, about the product qualities, usability. We discuss all the stuff about the users and then if it's not usable, hmm. efficiency means uh, uh, good uh, usage of the resources. 
performance, space, uh, well, if you're talking about mobile, I would also add the battery. Ah, a very nice application, but it eats up your battery in uh, one minute, okay. Um, reliability, it doesn't crash, it doesn't lose your data. Hmm? Portability, I bet I have uh, this other model of device uh, that work on it. Uh, I have another uh, type of operating system that it work. Hmm? Is it compatible with my browser? And these are the ones that we are most likely to see and to discuss. Others may be some requirement that you will find if you go to work in a company. So uh, usually software companies have some internal code, internal rules about how to develop software, what are the tools, uh, what are the languages, and so on. Here, you, uh, one of the organization requirements here would be you need to use GitHub for your source code. So that would be one requirement that it comes from the organization, doesn't come from the project requirement. The organization for which you're working, say, let's play this game, sets some constraints on you about the way you, you develop your code. And, and even, even less about the domain, the external requirement, the application, and so on. I just want to show you some examples of non-functional requirements about our rooster. Um, the mobile interfaces must be compatible with iOS version. It doesn't, if I stop here, it doesn't mean anything because iOS has different versions. So version 8.0 and later, and Android version 4.2 and later. Okay, every developer should learn this and uh, spell them every morning. Uh, because they need to remember every line of code to say, okay, that this should be, should, uh, say, satisfy this requirement. That the system will be localized in many languages, and the default one will be English. It's not something that you can, can, uh, can add later on, translate into a different language. Either you decide it from day one, or it will be a mess to, you will need to rewrite the code. Hmm? Uh, Non-functional requirements 18, the system should work in reduced condition even the user mobile device is switched off or disconnected. So what happens if, if the battery of the phone runs out during the night? Of course, the, sun, the, the phone will not ring. It doesn't have any battery left. But the rest of the devices should be able to wake me up anyway. How? I don't know. It's a non-functional requirement. It's just something that must be there. The way we implement the functional requirements, the ringing functionality, must be affected by this rule, by this constraint. Take into account that, that it's a, this is one instance of a reliability requirement. How the system works is if something breaks down or just wears out the battery. The web interface will be compatible with browser this and this and that version, at least this and this and that. And so when you're developing your JavaScript, you need to test and check all these browsers. Or uh, the system in the web interface might be responsive and adapt to different resolution from this minimum and to this maximum resolution that should work well and something like that. So this kind of non-functional requirements, they could apply to any kind of project, probably. You need, we need to customize them on us. Don't be too hard on yourself or don't be too demanding on this because there will be a, otherwise you will have a lot of uh, additional work to do. But for example, it would be a, a mistake to deliver a one requirement document without stating the compatibility with the operating system. Where does it run? What devices the, the user interface will run? You can limit yourself. It only runs on my phone. Okay, it's a kind of strange, but uh, it's this kind of requirement but it must be there, okay? So for today, I'm stopping here. Next, next time we'll see about the, how to write some hints or qualities about how to write these requirements and go on with the process. But for now, we'll uh, give a little break and then a little Python after that. Hmm? Thank you.